Hey everybody, my name is Matthew Bauman and I'm here to introduce the speaker for today. Um, I have worked with Cisco over the last two and a half years as we've rolled out Domo to over 1,500 marketers. We're now working with uh, many of the divisions across Cisco and Brian was with us from the beginning uh, and he's one of the just brilliant analysts uh, at Cisco who helped us put together a whole data program which is a lot of what he's going to share with you today. So everybody welcome to the stage, Brian Fentress. Yeah, thank you. All right, so here, what we're here to talk about today is fostering data obsession. First thing I want to ask real quick, was anybody here last year and did you happen to go to, I believe it was called the Stranger Things of Data Visualization? Okay, please do not compare what I'm about to show you to that because it's nowhere close. It was, this is, that was an inspiration for me. It really set the tone for me for the next year. Um, and I kind of, got me to do this, um, but it's not gonna look anything like that, so lower your expectations, please. <laughs> um, again, my name is Brian Fentress. I work for the, um, for the Analytics and Insights team for the Americas, so we cover everything, Canada, US, Central America, South America, all those things. Um, and prior to coming to Cisco, I did everything. I, did, I was all in uh, B2C and that sort of thing, and then I moved to B2B, so it was very interesting for me coming in and learning all that stuff. Okay, so at Cisco, when we had Domo, right, we were able to we put massive amounts of data in, at people's fingertips, dazzle them with a whole bunch of exotic charts, and really create dashboards for anything that they wanted to, any kind of use case. However, what that ended up in is drinking from the fire hose, right? So how do we train, or rather, how do we tame this dragon? We're gonna do this, we did it by being consistent, by being relevant, by being intuitive, and also fostering that data obsessive culture. Okay, so before getting to that, let me set the stage a little bit on uh, how, we got, how we got there and, and kind of what led us to actually creating this thing, right? So what we did, we actually, it's called, uh, we call it the AMC Explorer. AMC stands for America's Marketing Communications. Again, doesn't really matter, but just to let you know, it's in the presentation a couple of times. So first, let's go through the timeline. Um, in June of 2017, we opened up Domo to the anticipated power users. And we did this so that um, when we opened it up to everybody, they would be able to, there's content there for them to see, they wouldn't just be going to a whole bunch of blank pages. At the time, there were pockets, probably more than pockets, but there were pockets of people that were using data um, to make decisions. However, by and large, it was, this tactic has worked for years, let's just keep doing it, right? In October of 2017, we had some pages, we had some content, and we opened it up to open Domo up to the masses, okay? And what we started hearing is, oh my God, this looks kind of cool, but there's a whole lot of data. Again, going back to drinking from the fire hose. So that really started to spur us, like how, what can we do? What can we do to help people find what it is that they're looking for and really focus on, focusing them? So in early 2018, we came up with this idea of the AMC Explorer. So the idea was to give people a place to go, a place to where they know where everything is, certified cards, source of truth, version of truth. And when we released it, we started hearing things like, oh my God, this is awesome, this is great, these cards are beautiful, we're really starting to use it. And then finally, in the middle of last year, we started, we got this, this is an actual quote from a user. This is the first time we sat together as a team and looked at the data together to determine priorities. I was ready to quit Cisco right there. I was done, right? Perfect. Um, but had a little bit more work to do. So let's also, so that's the timeline. So let me show you a little bit uh, of the numbers, okay? So we're at about uh, 1,000 users, Matthew said. We're about 1,300, 1,500 users. And in a 30-day period, um, we had about 604 people accessing our pages. Now this was back in like November around the holidays when I pulled these numbers, so they're a little bit on the low side. But again, 604 users looking at 4,500 cards on over 700 pages, okay? So people were using Domo, but they were all over the place, right? They're still using it, but they're all over the place. 
So what were they seeing when they actually got there before we launched the Explorer? Okay. First thing they were seeing was similar graphs showing slightly different numbers. So you look at these graphs, they look about the same. They're, all, they're both trending about the same. The colors are slightly different. But if you look in the summary numbers, there's a little, they're a little bit off, right? If you look in the uh, x-axis, one's using start of week, the other one's using our fiscal week numbers. Um, and then the graph on the, your right is showing the, um, the predictions, right? Again, it's about the same, but they're still slightly different and slightly different numbers. Then you have the other situation where you've got different graphs that are showing the exact same numbers. Again, I guess this is a little bit better situation, but you can see all the summer numbers match exactly the same. But imagine going into a meeting with a VP or a higher up or something, and they're used to seeing the bar chart, right? Just the tree map shows exactly the same numbers, but you go into this meeting, you set it down in front of them, and then you have to, maybe you can just say, yeah, these are the same, and they'll accept it and you can move on. But I bet you, you also could spend 10 or 15 minutes trying to convince them that these numbers are exactly the same, but theirs is just the same as the one that you did, right? So you can see how that could slow down the progress. So that's the stage, that's what was going on. So what was the vision behind what we created? Okay, we wanted to create an area in Domo for users across the Americas in different marketing disciplines that is trusted, it is relevant on a day-to-day -day basis, contains intuitive visuals and navigation, and fosters a data-obsessed culture. Awesome, I wish we could do that. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about what that is. That's really what you're talking about here is three habits and a mindset, right? The three habits being be consistent, be relative, be intuitive, and then finally being having that mindset of being data obsessed. Okay, so let's talk about the what and the how for each one of these. Okay. Be consistent. You wanna create that single version of truth by using a single source for each data type and then certifying your cards in, uh, in some way. Relevant, you wanna address the daily needs of your customers that they are asking for, as well as trying to anticipate the ones that they don't even know yet, right? You're the data professional, you hopefully get in the meetings, try to understand what it is that they're looking for. Make it intuitive, you wanna reduce the cognitive load. I love saying reduce the cognitive load. The people that I work with make fun of me all the time, but I love it, it really is, and I love it, I just love it. Um, you want to do this by standardizing the look and feel of the visuals and making it easy for people to find what it is that they're looking for. So once you have those three habits, what are you going to do? You're going to give this thing a really catchy name, you're going to follow people around, and you're just going to constantly whisper it in the ear till they just want to go look at it. If you really want some more practical things, that's really not your thing. Again, you want to foster that data-driven culture by conducting trading and then constantly iterate, add, and adjust. Okay, so this is what we're gonna talk about for the next little bit. So we're gonna dive into each one of these pillars, steps, whatever you wanna call them. I couldn't figure it out, so I didn't name them in my presentation. All right, so let's start with being consistent. So when I was researching this thing, uh, I searched on the internet for the single source of truth to get a good definition. <laughs> and I actually realized there's actually two. There's a single source of truth, and then there's a single version of the truth. And since it's out on the internet, it must be true and it must be right, right? So the single source of truth is more of a data storage thing, and it's to always source a particular piece of data from a single source. The single version of truth is one view of the data that everyone agrees is the right thing, right? So to put this in context, if you think about um, your web analytics, um, you, if you have both Google Analytics and Adobe Analytics out there, you, know, you have Google Analytics, you have Adobe Analytics, and you might even have raw web logs. I can guarantee you that if you pull numbers from all three of them, they will never match. And if they do, I would question the numbers. Hopefully, they're gonna be trending in the same direction. Same thing, if you're in a B2B organization, your Salesforce and your raw revenue data, 
And then for e-commerce, you can get your sales from Magento, or you can get them again from Google Analytics. Again, hopefully they're about the same, but they're never going to be the same. So what is the version of truth that everyone agrees is the numbers that we're gonna talk about? Okay, so what we're building here is we're building a destination for answers that's gonna anchor those discussions. Right, we really wanna make sure that when people go into meetings or if they have questions when they're walking around, that they know where they're going to go and it's gonna anchor those data-driven discussions. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that people know, again, going back to the single version of truth, how do we let them know there's a single version of truth? So you know, a couple ways to do this for certification. Um, you can either use the certification functionality that Demo has and you can just search the knowledge base for it if you're not familiar with it. The other way um, that really right now, the way we're doing at Cisco is you just make sure that everything is going through one or two knowledgeable people so that when it gets published to everybody, that everybody knows that that is the source of truth. Okay, so that's consistent. Let's talk about being, let's talk about being uh, relevant now, so addressing the daily needs of your customers. How do we do that? How are you gonna go, go about making sure that this thing that you're building is gonna address everybody's needs? Well. Go out and you want to talk to your end users. Again, you just want to go out and talk, 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 make sure you know what they're talking, make sure you know what's going on. Better yet, you want to make sure you're listening. So you're not doing the one all the talking like I'm doing right now. You want to make sure you're listening to what people are saying. So again, how do you do that? How do you want to make sure that people, you're listening to what it is that they need? So you've got, um, you can ask, just make sure you're asking good questions. So these are four questions here that, the that you can ask them. Number one, what business questions do they ask or get asked every single week or every single day? Okay. What insight would make their job easier? Because if it make it easier for them, they're gonna be more on board with what you're doing. What types of data are they looking for? So you know, when you're having these discussions, try not to let them focus on very specifics, or some of them start with specifics, but trying to go larger. What is it, what kinds of things that you're doing? Again, so going back to trying to address the data gaps that maybe they don't even know it, know exist yet, so you can try to tease those out. And then what challenges are they, ex are they experiencing with getting what they need for demo? So again, in our situation, we already had demo launched, everybody's going out there. So what is it, that, what problems were they having and understanding what their pain points are so that we can adjust them? Okay, so now that we've asked those good questions, we're ready to start building, building our area, right? So we wanna make sure we're checking in. So while you're, while you're answering those questions or while you're asking those questions to your users, you're probably going to be able to identify a handful of people that are really interested in what you're doing and are really have a stake in what you're doing. So you wanna to try to grab those people and use them as your beta users, your beta testers. So I really would encourage while you're building this area, to give them access to it the whole time. Don't, you know, they're there, tell them, hey, don't share this out, things are gonna be cha changing, but let them go in there, use it, encourage them to give you feedback as you're building it, so that you just gonna, you don't have to build this whole thing and at the end go back and change it, right? Once you have it built, you wanna pull together those, those beta users again and have a more formal review of what it is that they are, um, that they're looking at. So you, so you want their feedback, right? Because again, what you don't want to do is you don't want to have this area, maybe you used the wrong terminology, or maybe it was the terminology in the company a month ago that's changed, right? So you don't want people, you don't want to open it up to everybody and then have terminology changed and everybody's confused and nobody can find it and things are moving around. So use this uh, formal review so that you can kind of set things in stone before you release it. And then thirdly, you want to make sure you continue to engage those users, either those users or other users to make sure, again, going back to iterate, add, and adjust, to make sure that things are working. Now, um, in Cisco, we did really good at grabbing those users. We, did really, we actually did pull them together for that, uh, that full review. What we didn't do a great job of is that continually asking them what's going on, how are you using it, and kind of checking in with them. Uh, honestly, the life happened, right? You get other priorities and it's easy. It's not that, you know, this isn't, 
my day job, it's something that we're doing, right? So we do other stuff. So it's easy to get lost. So you just wanna make sure you have that discipline, put it on your calendar to constantly check in. So uh, the other thing that you wanna do while you're building this to make sure it's uh, addressing the daily needs, if you remember, we have a whole bunch of cards out there. Um, you wanna make sure that the cards that are out there have a purpose, right? You don't card, just a bunch of cards out there. Make sure that every card you have out there has a purpose. So these are three guiding principles, if you will, to ask. Does the card provide visibility into a specific goal? Does it enable a data-driven strategy or does it measure a data-driven strategy? So a lot of those kind of sound a lot, uh, a lot alike, so we're gonna dig into a little bit, give you a couple examples. So the first example here, one, I'm sure you guys have all recognized these, one's is a gauge, one is showing the uh, results by week, but um, if you can look, maybe see, uh, there's a blue line there showing our goals, right? So we're measuring towards the goal, it's very clear, here's our goals, we're measuring against them. So the next one, uh, does, the, does the card enable a data-driven strategy? Now this is, it's, it's a little bit of a mess, I guess. But um, basically what this is doing is it's allowing our content, peop, our content creators to go in and figure out what types of content are working and what's not working. And in addition to that, what we've done here is we've used the quick filters on the right to allow them to really dig down and figure out, like to really address their exact question. So they don't wanna just go in and look at content across everything that's out there in Cisco. They wanna look at, for example, what, are, what content of the paid traffic using the best? What about the US? What about if it's in our collaboration area? So it really allows them to drive what they're going to do next. And then finally, uh, measuring a specific data-driven strategy. So these cards are some uh, for measuring our paid media. One of them is showing uh, where we're actually spending, where the spend is going. So it allows the, the people in paid media to really understand how that spend is working on a week-to-week -week basis, how it's broken up. And the other one is actually showing results. So you have the spend, now are we getting the KPIs, the metrics, our optimization metrics, how is that working? Okay, so we talked about being consistent, talked about being relevant. So now let's talk about intuitive and my favorite phrase, cognitive load or reducing the cognitive load. So what is the definition of cognitive load? Okay, it is the total amount of mental effort being used by the working memory. It's a good, great definition, great. So okay, what does that actually mean when you're building cards? It means make sure you wanna keep it simple, keep it predictable, keep it sane. So when you're building these cards, you don't wanna to try to answer seven different questions on a single card. You want one thing on there. You want to make it predictable so that when you're going from one card to the next, they know what they're looking at. They can predict easily what it is. And again, going back to keeping it sane, you don't want 12 different lines on there. Even if it's one metric, you don't want 12 different lines. You want to make it easier to read. So uh, kind of like, what, is this, what does this look like? So what you're seeing here is you're seeing six different graphs, and if you see across the six, uh, six different graphs across three different KPIs. And if you can see that these six graphs look very similar as you go from one KPI to the next. Now what this allows the user to do, again, is being predictable. So they can look at the, uh, the first graph, right? And they know, okay, this is looking at this KPI one by region to goal. And then they can easily go to the second one, and it's the exact same graph but it's a different color. So then that cues them to say, this exact same graph, different color, must be a different metric. So it allows you to standardize and allow people to easily look at a graph and know what it means, or a visual, know what it means without having to figure it out. So they spend more time trying to interpret what the data is and not just figuring out what the graph has actually said and how you put it together. Okay, so that's, those are the visuals. So the other thing that you do is you wanna make the, the navigation simple. So quick question, how many people out there have already started using the storyboarding or the dashboarding? Have you guys started using it? A couple of you, okay. So this is actually done by one of my colleagues, Drew. Hi, Drew. Um, and what this, it's, it's the images and it allows you to click on the image and it takes them to the subpage. But it's a very intuitive way to allow people to go from one place to the next. So it's a homepage, essentially. They can go in, they don't have to try to read the, the little 
subpages at the top of the navigation and try to interpret what they mean. They can go here and there's a definition about what it is and how to get there. So again, it's, it's an easy way to simplify the navigation. It's probably a, a navigation kind of thing that they're used to using on a, a regular page or a different, uh, different tool. All right, so those are the habits. Now let's talk about the fun part. How do we foster that data-obsessed mindset? Okay, so again, you've created this thing, your beta users have looked at it and they've checked off on it, and you're ready to launch this thing out into the world. How do we do that? So, make a production out of the release. Try to get your senior, not try, but make sure your senior, senior leadership is on board. Have them push it. Make it fun. I'm sure you can't, probably won't have the, the money to throw, throw some kind of concert or something, but try to make it fun. Try to get some excitement going around it. And then also offer training. Make sure that, again, while everything is intuitive out there, you want people to, to walk them through it to make them understand about how you set it up so they understand what it is, what you understand what you put together. Now at Cisco, when we offered the training, it was optional training, and we had like, a, I think like 140 to 150 people on a WebEx to walk through this thing. So people are, were interested in seeing it. And then the other thing that we've started talking about is how to keep people continually going back and continually looking at this thing, and that's gamification, right? So somehow set some kind of points around it, so if they go make cards, if they look at a card, uh, we'll talk about reporting here in a second, but you can see the people that are using it and you know, make it flashy, put their name up in lights or something on a weekly basis. So it's just some way to drive people the repeat, the, the repeat uh, usage. Okay, and I've said this several times, you wanna make sure you iterate, add, and adjust. You don't want this thing, don't let it go stale, and uh, make sure you keep it relevant. Okay, does everybody know what this is over here on this? All right, good, so I'm not the only old one, perfect. Um, yeah, you wanna make sure you keep it relevant, because you don't want cards out there, especially as fast as demos releasing new features. You wanna to try to keep things up to date. You wanna to try to stay relevant, and so that it's easier, you want people to keep coming back, yeah, you want to keep people coming back. All right, so finally, people are going, we've built this thing, you've launched it, you've done your training, you got people coming back, coming and using it. Now, we are asking people to come look at the data and measure what they're doing. You should report on your creation as well, right? So um, what you're doing over here on the left side, I use the last 30 days just because, I mean, per week, whatever, but this is showing how many people came back. Now, my goal was between 75 and 100 people. Again, in my defense, this was right around the holidays, uh, so it was a little bit on the low end. I think I checked it last week, and we're about in that 75, 80 range, so it's awesome. And then the other thing, the other table with this table, the other, with the other table, table, table is showing you, is that it's the, the, the different pages, the different sub pages. And it will show you the number of distinct users and the number of views. So what that allows you to do is now you can see, is it one person looking at a page a million times? Or is it a million different people looking at a page one time? So it allows you, again, going back to the iterate, add, and adjust, it allows you to identify um, the places where you need to concentrate. The other report that I didn't put up there because it had people's names in it um, is you can actually see who's using, using your creation and what pages they're using. So again, going back to engaging your users, you can see what users that you need to engage, the people that are, that are actually using it so you can go talk to them. You can also see who's not using it. So if you have a manager or again, somebody that should be using it, and their name is not on the list, maybe you wanna give them a call because maybe there's a reason why they're not going there. Maybe, they, maybe it's not satisfying their needs, but it gives you that information to figure out how to address it. Okay, that's it. That's the, the uh, be consistent, be relevant, be intuitive, and be obsessed. Now, the other thing I wanna point out too is I'm the one standing up here. There was, there was a lot of people that helped me get this up and running, not helped me. We did it as a team to get this up and running. You're probably not gonna do this by yourself, maybe, I don't know um, if you're unfortunate. Um, but, but I did not do this by myself. And unfortunately, the person that really helped me couldn't be here because I was going to give a prize away if somebody got her autograph or a selfie with her, so maybe that was good for her. But 
Um, real quick though, the other thing, so now this thing is launched, I want to talk a little bit about what's next in Cisco. Where are we going with this thing? Um, so again, talked about being consistent, like I talked before, we want to revisit the card certification. When we first launched this thing, card certification wasn't a thing. I don't think it had been launched yet or it's still in beta. So that's something we want to go back and address and think about how do we, how do we implement this thing, especially when we already have a bunch of cards out there. How can we get this moving? Um, in terms of being relevant, again, like I said, we want to make sure we're reaching out to those end users, make sure that while we do have people going there, we can tell it from the reports, we want to find out what they're using and still kind of figure out what data gaps they, are, they still have and address those. Um, intuitive, again, so Drew created the, that navigation page for something that he's done. We want to create the same thing for the AMC Explorer. Um, so that's the other thing that's on the list. And then finally, about being obsessive, uh, the continuing education, especially with the storyboarding coming out, we're probably, the whole look and feel is going to change and add the navigation. So we want to make sure we want to go back out to our users and explain to them what's changing and for the good and how to find, maybe just show them what's, what's going to be changing. And then finally, the gamification. And, um, Honestly, that's still kind of early stages. Me and um, my friend Anna that helped me do this were, taught, were discussing it. He said, hey, we should make a game out of this. And that's about as far as we've gone. So I put it in the presentation. Um, yeah, and that's it. So thank you guys. Uh, questions, comments? Thank you, Brian. We've got plenty of time for questions. Uh, I want to start off, Brian, by asking, digging a little bit, how did you set this up in a way that allowed your end users to do a little bit of their own exploration without you having to be the bottleneck? It really goes, I, so again, things are changing with the storyboarding and you're going to be able to put uh, page, the whole page filters at the top and let people drill down. But the other things, if you think about, back to that grid and the, the, uh, the bubble graph, um, using the quick filters to allow people to drill down to what, to what it is that they're really looking for. Like I said, we cover all of the Americas. What Canada, Canada wants to see is not what the U.S. wants to see, is not what Mexico wants to see. But we can build this one place for everybody and then they can filter down to their needs, to their country, and so that they can really find it. So we use that to help scale it as well. One, one more question, then I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, in working with you, I noticed one section of the AMC Explorer where you uh, provided example cards. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, we have a card library. Is that what you're That's referring to? That's what I'm getting at, yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. So uh, that was something that was in the presentation, in and out of the presentation a couple of times. So uh, going back to, to navigation, so what we did is um, we've got a bunch of different pages out here but you can imagine the same card would probably li live across multiple pages. So what we did is we created a card library where we put all the cards in there and then used move copy and put them on the different pages. So now, uh, talking about scaling, you can go to one place, make adjustments to that cards and, it's, and it propagates out. So the other thing this allows us to do is it allows us to, to organize the cards on the pages one way which might be by, I don't know, by life cycle or something like that. But in the card library, it allows us to organize them by metric or a different way of measuring them. So now the users have two different ways to find the information that they're, that they're looking for. Cool. Great. Thanks, Brian. Let's open it up to the audience. Any questions? Easy questions only, please. It's late in the afternoon. <laughs> How are you? Good job. Thank you. Uh, one thing I, I, I found with Obsessive, first of all, I, have a, I guess I have two questions. How many users have editor rights to create cards for you? I, can I just say too many, in my, in my humble opinion? Um, but yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, this is a way to try to rein that in as a single version of truth. So, what we wanted to do is we wanted to give people a place to come. We didn't necessarily want to limit people. They could access the data. We didn't want to limit them and tell them they couldn't come explore the data. So a lot of people have that editor access to be able to build cards and, and do it that way. But. 
So have you tried to reduce the number of cards that you have available? How, do I, how did we reduce the number of cards? Yeah. So when we launched it, there was a whole bunch of cards. So people can still build as many cards as they want, right? That's not, we're not saying you can't go build cards, and that's, I guess that's not what I'm saying here. What we wanted to do is in this area, in this space, we locked the pages down. So again, this is the single version, it's supposed to be the single version of Truth. So people can build any cards that they want, but if they're the number, if they're supposed to tie back to these numbers and they don't, then they need to explain what they did to make them different, right? So this is a single version. This is, so for most people, we want them to go here first. If they don't find what they need, they can ask somebody else to build them or they can build it themselves. Did that answer your question, sort of? I, I've just found, I mean, we've been on it for almost three years and I've found that there's a lot of cards out there that are very similar, maybe just filtered versions different. Yes. So, again, so what this is supposed to, the idea of this is to give people a destination to go, and it is locked, supposed to be locked down, so that if they come here, you're not going to continually add cards. Everyone that has editor access can build cards, but what they don't have the ability to, to do is add cards to this area. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's a good idea. Okay. Anybody else? I'll do the best I can on order here, but. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is, just on the AMC Explorer, is that just a page in Domo, or is that like an external website that's linking to pages in Domo, or what is this destination? So it is a page in Domo with a bunch of uh, sub-pages underneath it. And if you go back to that navigation page, that, you know, that would be kind of your top page. You wanna, that's the URL that you would share to people. They could bookmark anything they want, but the idea is go here, here's your top page, and then they could go off into the different subpages if they want through that navigation. Is that what you were kind of asking about? Okay. Is the card library then on just one of those subpages? Yes. Same under the AMC mm -hmm. brand, just everyone has access to that still. Yes. Okay. Yeah, again, that's the idea is so that people, if they decide maybe they don't, maybe we didn't put a card that they necessarily wanted or needed in their area. So we kind of, when we, what I didn't show here is we did it by role. So we have content creators, we have marketing people, we have other marketing people that are interested in different stats. So each one of them kind of had, had their own site, their own area. But if they wanted something and couldn't find it, they could go to the car library and look at it by metric to see if it was already existed. Okay, my question is, are, what practical resources did you go to to even get there? Because we are just rolling this out, and unlike you, I'm responsible for all of it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so I need practical resources of places to go and sort through how to actually do this. I mean, what resources did I tap into to create all the cards? Yeah. Well, even even the back data to get to the cards and well i know that i mean so we had again we've used demo before so i knew the data i had built some of the problems i guess if you will like when we first launched this thing again we wanted content for everybody but we didn't necessarily know what it is that they wanted because we had first just launched it so this was kind of the next iteration of it so i kind of already knew knew the data um, I was in a bunch of meetings, I mean, I'm always in meetings, just even if I just sit there and just listen to the kinds of questions, it will give you an idea of maybe, again, identifying those data gaps that maybe they don't even know about, right? Um, again, I'm not sure if that's answering your question or if that's a good answer, but. <laughs> I, and, you know, and again, like I was saying, we have a bunch of editors, so a lot of times, so a lot of these, some of these cards are already built or we already had the idea for a lot of these cards, but we just needed to standardize them. Right, so we need to make sure that we pull that information in and we, what colors, what shade of blue are we going to use? What's the secondary color, right? Are we gonna use line graphs or are we gonna use bar graphs? So that sort of thing to help standardize it. So we can talk later if you need more information. Do you have like calls with the other editors or kind of like standards, like you said, like 
for specific KPIs, use only these colors, or for this, use only? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> I mean, it, I, in an ideal world, yes. In an ideal world, you know, what I did, even for me, one of the hardest things was actually trying to figure out how to standardize this thing. Um, and I actually stopped one day, opened up Word, and laid out the standard, the standardizations, what colors, what, you know, what did I want, how are we going to name things on the, the summary numbers, right? So we just laid them out so I could share them with other people. And I did share them to make sure that they were QCing. But yes, in, in an ideal world, if you did have a, a group of editors that were building in the same area, they would have their standards in front of them and you could go, th go through them. Hi, um, thanks for the presentation, this was great. Um, you mentioned senior leadership buy-in. Um, that's kind of one of the parts I struggle with, so can you share some like tactics uh, that you were able to use to get that buy-in, uh, especially since I'm in finance. We use Domo heavily in finance, and I mm -hmm. see it as being a broader resource, mm -hmm. um, but that cross-departmental senior leadership buy-in is current. Are you saying like your senior leader leadership isn't bought into the particular area or into having things in Domo or going there themselves? My finance senior leadership team, which is just AVP, um, yeah, they're in, they're good with Domo and we use it, I mean, a lot, um, but it's really getting like a marketing, ops, uh, project management, it's the other senior leadership mm -hmm. members. You know, I wished I had a good answer for you. I mean, Robert, the standing is still, he did a good job when we launched Domo. We already had that senior support. Um, and again, I guess the other thing too, but I'm realizing, I thought we had a lot of users and I'm starting to hear a lot of people that are talking about 15,000 users, like, oh my God. But I think that as big as Cisco is, this is really only for, this is for the marketing group, right? So it is only the marketing organization right now. I believe we're starting to use it, not, not that I'm associated with in other areas, other instances of demo. Um, but yeah, we had buy-in from the very beginning on this, so I wish I had a better answer for you. No worries, thanks. Make it easier. I mean, I guess the thing is make it easier for them. Make it, make, show them how it's going to make them look good and make their life easier. I mean, that's, you know, if it's easy for them, they're gonna, you know, what's in it for them? That's probably the best gen generic <laughs> advice I have for you. Thank you. What was your reason for creating subpages versus collections on one page? Was it just the quantity or? Um, because, so we had a bunch of different roles, right? So if you could imagine in, in just the way that we're going, so if you use the collections, you can only go one deep, right? So again, so you have marketing, you have content, you have what we call the kind of more of our marketing with our sales team. They're all looking at different things. And inside of each one of those, there's different metrics that they wanna, wanna look at. So we utilize, utilize the subpages and then the collections. Now the other thing, I, I love the, the, the storytelling feature, storyboarding, dashboards, I don't know what we're calling it, but um, it, it's going to, what's that? Demo stories, thank you. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's a game changer to be honest, and it's gonna allow you to lay out things. You don't even need to worry about collections anymore. Um, you're gonna be able to lay out things a lot easier. Thanks. Question back. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Have you built any kind of data dictionary to get everyone on board with the same language internally? Yes. <laughs> um, and again, going, going back to that, the follow-up, you know, we have built it, it's out there, it probably needs to be updated, it probably needs a little bit of love, um, but it's there, and that's the other thing, is the thing about a data dictionary, the thing about, you know, again, kind of one of the potholes we fell into when we originally built this, is we put it out there and then we walked away and life took over. Um, but something like a data dictionary, things are constantly changing, or maybe you realize when you put it together, maybe you, Half of it was talking to marketing, the other half was a lot more technical. So you need to kind of, what you learn over time, you need to go back and adjust that. So yes, we do, but it probably needs some love. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is regarding consistency. Um, so when you are an inter international company, all of your data sits in UTC. But then if marketing is doing some campaign in West Coast or East Coast, they probably want us to replicate those 50 cards just because of their marketing campaign into EST. How do you tackle a problem like that? 
Um, let me see. Let me see if I can under, if I get the the question or not. So you have got marketing that wants a set of cards, and you got another group of people that have a set of cards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So we're talking about you have East Coast, you have a campaign run in the East, and we're in the West. How do you make sure that they're, they're consistent? So, you know, actually we, we just kind of ran it, I don't want to say ran into this problem, but we started doing a lot of campaigns and we have one that, that started and then another one started right on its heels. But we wanted a consistent, again, consistency. We want people to go look at least a core set of cards and then they can go off and make other things if they want to dig down. So you just have to have a flag in your data, to be honest. We just used a flag saying this is campaign one and you, again, with the dashboards, this is a lot easier because the, the page filters are a lot easier to use. So it's, it's at the very top. I want to look at campaign one, and then all the cards filter to that. And then you can select campaign two, and all the cards filter to that. So does that answer your question? OK. Hey, everybody, we have about time for two more questions. We'll start with this one, and then uh, feel free to okay. talk to Brian afterwards. I promise I'll invite <laughs> anybody again. Thanks. <laughs> This guy. Why, why? Why, man? Um, so, how do you handle uh, relationships with external agencies that you work with? Um, this is a self serving question, right? Um, but, can you give examples of how you work with folks that may not be inside your organization but that are adjacent to your organization? And how do you handle the differences between the stuff that they build and the stuff that you build? I know that we've gone through that before. Yeah, I mean, going back to consistency, you know, does it have to be consistent? Does the AMC Explorer have to be consistent with the what the paid media team is is building completely separate? I think it would help that if at least there was a recognition of you know we want to standardize some of these things so they're at least sort of looking the same, but they are complete two completely different areas, which helps they're adjacent. Um, but in terms of like how do we work with them, I mean, you know. So he works with uh, DWA, or one of our ad agencies that we work with, and they have access. And he's gone in and used the storyboards, the demo stories, and built a really cool dashboard um, using that data. So did that answer your question? OK, cool. We have can, you, can you actually talk a little bit more about how the demo stories feature works? Oh, man. Um, OK. so. If you have a page that already has collections, you say it has two or three collections on it, the wrench that's in the top right of the, of the page, you can drop it down and it will say, and right now it says uh, convert to dashboards or something like that. And you click it, and it says, do you want to click this? To, do you want to convert to dashboards? And then it goes off and it does its thing and actually creates it for you. And each collection would have another section in it, um, and then you can, it, there's different uh, formats in it that you can arrange. I'm doing a very poor explanation of it. It's it is very it's actually very intuitive once you look at it, and they've done a lot of work from when we saw it in beta to where it is today. It's gone from being this is kind of cool to like oh my gosh, this is really usable. We love it. So the, the picture that you had up where you said you could drill down that was from that that dashboard feature. Or the Domo Stories feature? Mm -hmm. the, the navigation? Mm -hmm. This one? Yes. Yeah. So it allows you to put images in there. So it, it, part of it, you can just put an image. And then you can attach basically a link behind it. So when they click on it, it just takes them to that, to that sub page. So. So I would for that question. I'll just be loud if this isn't on. Oh, there it is. Uh, Domo Stories, you'll probably see more about that tomorrow on main stage, I suspect. If not, it is in our internal Domo instance. So that means it's coming to you guys really soon. And you guys will get, uh, get access to that and see it. But I suspect you will see it here tomorrow. Great question, though. Hey, Brian, well, we're out of time. Brian, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate the par partnership with Cisco. Uh, and thank you for sharing your insights with us today and helping us get where we need to be. Thank you. Okay.